Okay, uh, I think we'll get started now. <clears throat> Hi everyone, my name is Sophia Irwin. Today you'll hear from myself and my colleague Charles Tan about our journey in developing and deploying a direct link between our data lake and our Apache Flink applications. To do this, we built a custom Flink source that allows our Flink applications to directly read from our data lake, which helps us to provide better support for machine learning use cases. First, a word about Yelp's mission. Yelp's mission is to connect people with great local businesses. We do this by creating interaction with users and businesses. As a result, we process a large amount of data and having an efficient low latency data backend is important to us. And so more, rec uh, so, um, more recently, we have been shifting uh, our data processing infrastructure from batch-based to more real-time. During the talk, I'll be giving a brief introduction to motivate the topic and some context. Then I'll overview the architecture of the system. Next, my colleague Charles will review the challenges we faced in developing and deploying the system. And he will discuss our use case and future work. First, let's answer, answer this fundamental question of what is stream processing. So traditionally, data processing has referred to the processing of data at rest. Where could this data be at rest? Well, it could be at rest in a relational database, in a NoSQL database, in a series of files and storage, in pretty much any place where you had absolutely all the data that you needed for all <clears throat> for your computation all available all at once. And the processing of the data happened in batched ways that were triggered by some external event or set to trigger, trigger with a per chronological periodicity. And this model of data processing had a few limitations. The first is that as data sizes became larger, the SQL queries or processing steps that needed to happen began to take longer. The second is that the latency of the resulting computation would be dri driven by the periodicity of the batch. However, not all computations require that the entirety of the data be immediately available in order to produce an intermediate or usable computation to be valid as of now. In response to this, technologies evolved in industry to allow for processing data messages individually as the data flowed in. Apache Flink is a technology that was adopted to fill this role at Yelp. So let's introduce our machine learning use case, which is the detection of bot signals in real time. We have a variety of sources, all of them providing data in the form of streaming messages via Kafka. The user team has a periodically updated model to categorize messages with a binary classifier based on information on several data streams that need to be kept in state. In most cases, their time window for the state is on the order of tens of minutes. All the predictions are written to a data store that is then further evaluated by a separate out-of-band batch process. The data sources from Kafka include, for example, traffic information, a quick stream, and information about spam. All of this amounts to billions of events per day, and even with a time-bounded window, this leads to a large state in the system. Let me provide an overview of Yelp's data pipeline ecosystem. Our data sources include change data capture logs, are the data, other data stores and published to, <clears throat> that publish to the streaming ecosystem, web processes, and also internal services. All of these sources are published from to the streaming ecosystem via several mechanisms. The primary mechanism is a schematized data pipeline producer. Others include a logging service and other leg legacy mechanisms. The data pipeline producer uses Avro encoding and registers all schemas in a schema storage layer. All these streams are then written to a topic in one of several Apache Kafka clusters. From there, these topics can be consumed by one or more of our Flink clusters, which run user application code. Notice that this is a recursive process. Ultimately, the data ends up in various databases, consumed by other services in various caching layers, or specifically in a large data lake. In the previous slide, I think you noticed that Kafka plays a central role in the streaming infrastructure at Yelp. There's one point to keep in mind. It is that Kafka stores data in topics and, there, and that there's limited retention for non-compacted topics. Users often want to compute over multiple topics wherein some are compacted and some are not. In the case of interest, the user's models did not require a training set that, that spanned a long chronological period. Despite this, it turned out that there was tremendous value in the flexibility of access to historical data. In talking with our target users, we realized that we had a missing piece in Yelp's data pipeline ecosystem. We were missing a good connection from the data lake back to Apache Flink. You see, our data lake was stored in AWS S3 in files stored in Parquet format, but our Flink applications could only read Avro serialized data from Kafka. 
So as we started to explore the idea of a data lake to Flink connection, we realized that there would be other benefits to having a connection from data lake to Flink. As we mentioned already, Kafka has limited retention for non-compacted topics. Therefore, backfilling from Kafka has limited utility. Since data lake is our source of truth for historical data, allowing Flink to consume from it via better, inter better integration helps to avoid a sort of data silo where one data system is not well integrated with other data systems. Additionally, machine learning stood to benefit because a better connection between data lake and Flink could allow ML teams to backfill historical data when ML models change. Or rerun data through the model or even potentially use data lake data for training. So now that we have motivated the need for a data lake to Flink connection, this brings us to the next section, which is the architectural overview. Let's examine the high-level architectural options available to us. There are two main high-level architectural options uh, that we considered. The first was a Kafka in the middle approach. You might ask, what does Kafka in the middle mean? Kafka in the middle means that if we have Kafka in, uh, data in the data lake, then that data would go to Kafka before being read by Flink. The second option we considered was a direct read approach. A direct read approach would mean that we directly read the data from data lake without involving Kafka. There are many advantages and disadvantages for each approach. For, the, for Kafka in the middle, the main advantage, and it was a very significant advantage, was that having Kafka in the middle introduced a level of interaction between data lake and Flink. However, this design also, also introduced the extra cost of the additional IO and load to Kafka. For the direct read approach, it was more efficient because we didn't have to uh, have the extra step of having Kafka in the middle. Also, conference talks and blog posts mentioned the direct read approach, and it seemed to be the way the industry was going. Conveniently, we also had an internal prototype at the time. But the main disadvantage was that the consumer logic that would have to understand how to read Yelp's data lake, and this would make the consumer more closely coupled to the Yelp's data lake and implementation. After all these considerations, we decided to pursue the direct read approach at the time. Now that we have reviewed the high-level architecture and the uh, high-level architectural decisions that we have made, um, uh, let's take a look at how a uh, um, uh, let's take a look at Yelp's data lake so that we can understand the consumer how the consumer should be structured. You can see here a detailed version of the data lake sync, which is a Flink application that generates parquet files containing data from Kafka and uploads them to S3 for storage in the data lake. The data stream on the left in teal color titled Kafka data stream is the Kafka data stream containing the input data. I will draw your attention to the stream on the right hand part of the diagram, also in teal color, titled Kafka DL sync metadata stream. This metadata stream, which I'll refer to as a state stream, is a Kafka topic that is all, that is a metadata store which consists of a stream of messages which we call data parts. These data parts are Kafka messages that contain metadata about each parquet file written to the data lake. The metadata in each data part includes schema information, pointers into S3, timestamps, offsets, uh, and other metadata. Because these metadata streams are not lengthy, the messages uh, and the messages are very small, we set the retention of the streams to forever. The metadata streams were not originally intended to be used as an index into the data lake. They're a byproduct of the upload process of the data lake sync application. But they contain all the information that we need to locate the parquet files in the data lake, and they were conveniently available to us as of the initial st start <coughs> of the data lake sync application design. So now that we've reviewed the data lake design, and we know that we have a stream of messages which we call data parts um, that index the data lake, let's quickly look at what is inside each of these metadata stream messages. Each, uh, each message has a payload, and within that payload are encoded some critical elements that are helpful for finding data in S3. There's a list of S3 paths in case the data is written to mul in multiple files. The partition key gives us an idea of the date time of the data set that's in the file. And since these files originated from some Kafka topic, a source Kafka topic, the payload data includes information about the source Kafka topic, such as the offset start and end for the data that was written and the data uh, Kafka cluster information of that topic and partition. Note another useful field, the earliest timestamp. This field is the earliest timestamp of the data within this data part. This field helps us to more accurately sort the data parts to understand which data part came before and after, even if they were from different partitions. So later on, when we want to try and recreate the data of the original Kafka topic as closely as possible from the data lake, we could do so theoretically by using all this metadata. 
So now that we uh, knew we had a metadata for the data lake, and now that we had decided that we wanted to have a direct connection, we started to think about how we would roll out a new consumer for our users. So we decided to have two consumers. The original consumer we had, which was a wrapper around the Flink Kafka consumer provided by the Flink API was one, and a new dual source consumer that would be a chameleon. It would consume from both Kafka and the data lake depending on what was required. Since these consumers were distributed internally as a library, the application could decide which consumer it wanted to call. When we started looking at how to actually implement this dual source consumer that we wanted, we realized that we would need to wrap two consumers. We already had a Flink Kafka consumer, which was our canonical data pipeline consumer. However, we did not have a consumer for the data lake, so we knew we had to write a new data lake source consumer to read from there. We would also have to write some logic to be able to switch, be switch between the two. Specifically, we could start processing as a data lake consumer and then continue processing as a Kafka consumer, for example. So we implemented the data lake source to extend the rich parallel source fun function interface. <clears throat> we implemented custom code to par parse the DLSync metadata stream you saw in the previous slide. And we run this in the data lake source construction, which takes place before any subtasks are created. The data part objects in memory mimic the data parts that you saw in the previous slide. The construction of the data lake source object then creates a full set of data parts that need to be consumed. The state contains information about these data parts and also about new objects that we call parquet file helpers. The parquet file helper objects uh, reference data parts and contain additional information about how many messages within a parquet file were processed and abstract away any parquet file I.O. or handling. This allows our state to keep track of which data part has already been consumed and which data part still needs to be read. At the beginning of the run process, we determine which of the data parts are the responsibility of this particular subtask and use a map to make it easy to retrieve information about the parquet file helper assigned to a data part. When a subtask completed all the files associated with it, that subtask could wait for a checkpoint to complete and then throw a data lake finished exception to indicate it was done. So after we were done with an implementation of the data lake source function, we moved on to the dual source function. As I mentioned before, the dual source controls which consumer we use. We realized that the dual source itself would extend the rich parallel source function too, since the dual source itself was a source and would be invoked as a source by the application. So the dual source ended up being a wrapper around the data lake source and the Kafka source. In that sense, the dual source ended up being the chameleon that we wanted. At startup, the dual source would read the state and also read the Kafka topics to see whether any new data had been written by the state topic. If all the S3 source data had been already been marked as processed by all the subtasks and there has uh, there had um, no new data had arrived to the Kafka state stream topics, then the dual source could decide to switch over and run in the mode and in labeled internally as Kafka mode. However, if there is some data in the data lake that still needed to be processed, then the dual source could create and invoke a data lake source uh, and run that. So now let's take a more detailed look at the initialization step of the data lake source. The data lake source is initialized based on data from the state stream topics in Kafka and the data lake. During initialization, the metadata stream topics are located in red, and then the Kafka source topic low watermarks are read to understand what offsets are the right offsets to transition from S3 to Kafka reads. Once we decide what data parts should be read by the data lake source, we create internal data part objects. And these data parts are assigned to specific subtasks at the startup of the subtask. Each data part is then mapped to a parquet file helper object. These parquet file helper objects maintain information about how far we have read within each data part. This is done by keeping a message consumed counter in the object. When we start up, we will not output those messages that we have already consumed. The parquet file helper also knows when it has completely consumed the particular file it points to. The parquet file helper has a simple iterator, in, iterator interface to iterate through all the messages in the data part. We pass these messages off to the source context within the run method of each data lake source subtask. As I mentioned, the switchover decision is made during initialization. After a state is loaded in the job manager during the construction of the consumer objects, the dual source consumer then checks every data part and parquet file helper that we have um, serialized out to the state to see if that data part has been read to completion. 
When all the data parts are completely consumed and the Kafka offsets of the start of the Kafka topic are lower than the Kafka offsets of the last data part processed, then the dual source consumer will switch the mode to be Kafka mode and wait for the state to be checkpointed. When the checkpoint is complete, an exception will be thrown, and the next time the application starts, the state mode will indicate that we need to run in Kafka mode and the Kafka consumer can be invoked. If the run type is an S3 only run type, meaning that the user wanted to backfill from some specific start date to some specific end date, the application will throw an exception and exit without invoking the uh, Kafka mode and let any supervising process know that it is complete. Since the state is the central mechanism for coordination in the dual source, it makes sense to take a closer look at the objects in the dual source consumer state. As I mentioned, the state includes state written out by the Flink Kafka consumer, which is a list of Kafka topic partitions and offsets. The state of the data lake source includes data part and parquet file helper objects, as well as uh, some, uh, and uh, additionally, the dual source state has some enums which uh, provide metadata information about uh, uh, the run type and the mode. The state serializes all of this data out to disk when it is written out. As a summary of what we discussed so far, the dual source has a simple concept and architecture and generally a simple configuration. But the implementation of a direct read consumer can be specific to the data lake architecture. And in practice, read and write performance becomes critical for the feasibility of larger backfills. Next, my colleague Charles Tan will review uh, in detail the challenges we ran into while developing and running backfills in a production environment. I'll hand the presentation over to him. Thanks, Sophia. All right, let me present. Um, okay. Yeah, thanks, Sophia, for talking through the introduction and the architectural overview. Uh, next, I'll outline some of the challenges that we faced. The first challenge that we faced was ordering our data file, our data lake files by event time. We're running into issues efficiently ordering all the parquet files since the files are only partitioned by date. For some of our larger Kafka topics where there was a lot of data, uh, reading the headers of each of the files to get their event times, then ordering them was time consuming and made the job initialization process take a lot longer. Our solution to this challenge was to once again utilize the data lake sync metadata stream, which already had the data parts ordered. So the data parts again are the messages that are in this metadata stream that provide pointers to the S3 location for a parquet file, as well as other fields pertaining to this parquet file, such as Kafka cluster, Kafka topic, and the starting Kafka offset for these records. By reading the data lake uh, sync metadata stream, we were able to more efficiently achieve ordering of data parts to speed up job init initialization. But the con is that our Flink source implementation is very tightly coupled to the data lake sync. Uh, the next challenge that we faced was handling data in a multi-region environment. So at Yelp, we run multiple Kafka clusters in different AWS regions. So by extension, a Kafka topic can exist in multiple regions. For our, uh, our original Flink Kafka consumer, we create a different consumer instance for each region so that we can have some control over deny listing regions uh, for a Flink job. So if a Flink job consumes from a Kafka topic with data in multiple regions, the Flink job will need to create a source operator for each of these regions. We've kept this abstraction for a dual source consumer as well. Uh, and I'll explain one challenge that this design created. So, Multiple consumers becomes an issue because subtasks have no way to track the progress of other subtasks. So when one consumer finishes his backfill, it has no idea if the other subtasks in the job have also finished. And there's no way to know if the job's uh, backfill is finished overall, and if it's safe to throw the data lake finished exception and attempt to do the switchover that Sophia talked about. So here we illustrate uh, two dual source consumers, and the first one has finished processing all the assigned parquet files. However, even though the subtask has finished its portion of the backfill, it doesn't know if the other subtasks have also completed their backfills, and thus it doesn't know if the job is complete or not. So luckily in Flink version 
the global aggregate manager was introduced to allow uh, state sharing across subtasks. So it's essentially an RPC call between the subtask and the job manager. The state is stored in the job manager and can be accessed by any subtask in the Flink job. So state can be shared among subtasks in one or many operators. Let me show you how we're able to leverage the global aggregate manager uh, interface to resolve our issue. So returning to our example, um, one consumer has finished its backfill. And then now, instead of being confused, if the, the backfill is complete overall for the job, the subtask will use Flink's global aggregate manager and tell the job manager that it has finished its backfill. The job manager will update the state to reflect that one subtask has finished its backfill and return count one to that subtask. So since the value of one was returned and the subtask knows that there are a total of two subtasks in this job, it knows that the other subtask must still be working through its data and it hasn't finished. So the first subtask will simply go to sleep and wait until that subtask has finished its portion of the backfill. Eventually the second subtask will finish processing its, uh, its backfill data and it will similarly use the global aggregate manager RPC call to communicate to the job manager that it's, it's finished its backfill. The job manager will now increment its count to two and return that value. The second subtask will see that the return is two and it knows that there are two subtasks. And so it knows that um, all the subtasks must be finished processing their backfill and it's safe to throw the data lake finish exception and continue with the switchover process. So to summarize, um, we can use the global aggregate manager to enable subtasks to share their progress with each other. This, uh, this allows us to orchestrate subtasks to ensure a smooth job switchover from Data Lake to Kafka when there are multiple source operators or when operators have parallelism greater than one. The third challenge that we encountered was a uh, watermark skew. So watermark skew can it, watermark skew occurs when the watermark or current event time of some subtasks advance more quickly than other subtasks in the same job. This can occur for a variety of reasons, but Two common reasons are when subtasks are uh, simply processing at different speeds or when there's an uneven distribution of data assigned to the subtask. Watermark skew can cause memory issues and back pressure in Flink operators, especially for Flink applications that utilize windowing. So I've included a ticket here that points to some of the uh, Flink open source community work to provide source synchronization for supported Flink sources such as Kafka and Kinesis. But since we implemented our own data lake source, uh, we needed to implement our own source synchronization to handle the watermark skew. So let's run through an example of watermark skew, which is caused by an uneven distribution of data to three subtasks for the same backfill period. Uh, so, for, so here we see three subtasks. They've been assigned different amounts of data. The first one uh, has a large volume of data. The second one has medium data. And the third subtask has uh, less data assigned to it. So suppose we want to backfill this data that we, uh, from the previous slide from event time zero to 1000 with a tumbling window of 10. Assuming that each of the, uh, the tasks processes at roughly the same rate, after they've had a chance to process 50 records, we'll see that task one's latest record had event time 50, test two, um, 100, and then test three, 500. So I mentioned um, tumbling windows and to help visualize tumbling windows and watermarks and their relationship, we can look at this graphic. The records from subtask one are in green, subtask two in blue, and subtask three in red. And since subtask one was assigned much more data than the other subtasks, you'll notice that the average interval and in event time between the records is a lot smaller than the other subtasks. And similarly, since subtask three has a low volume of data assigned to it, the average interval and in event time for its records is much longer, and it's caused multiple tumbling windows to open. So you'll see the uh, tumbling windows are these gray boxes, and you'll notice that only the first window has been able to close. And this is because all three subtasks are processing records with event times that are past the end of the first window. So in other words, each of the subtask watermarks have advanced past the end of the first window. And because of this, we can be sure that the first window will not be receiving any more records from any of the subtasks. So it's safe to close that window. The second window, on the other hand, can't close because subtask one could still emit a message in, in this window. Uh, we don't know what the event time for the next record from subtask one will be. 
And so we must keep this window open and any subsequent window open until we can be sure that the watermark for subtest one advances past the end of the, of the second window. So now we can see in this slide that um, subtask one has just processed a new record, which has an event time in window three. So the watermark for this subtask will have advanced past the end of uh, window two. And now at this point, the second window can safely close. So now with this, um, going back to our example, we can see that the downstream operator cannot advance past 50. So the global watermark for the system can't be past 50, um, which is the current watermark of subtask one. At this point in our example, there would be five closed windows and 45 open windows. And Flink would need to keep 85 records out of a total of 150 records in memory, since that's the number of records that are currently being held in open windows. As a size of our backfill scale, we can quickly see how watermark skew will lead to more records uh, needing to be held in memory and thus causing memory issues for our job. Our solution to dealing with this is once again, to take advantage of the global aggregate manager interface. And using this, we can create the concept of a global watermark that subtasks can update and check the value of. So when a particular subtask watermark advances too far ahead of the global watermark value, we can simply tell it to go to sleep uh, for however long and allow the other subtasks to catch up. This will prevent the fast subtask from emitting records into windows that won't be able to be closed in the near future. And it'll prevent uh, memory and back pressure issues that can actually help improve the throughput of the job. So we wanted to create some sort of benchmark to see how well our solution worked. Um, so here you can see we created a simple Flink application it has a key by operator, and then it's followed by a tumbling event time window of one minute. So with this benchmark, um, we, we ran our benchmark on a particularly skewed data set of test data. In this example, um, our data is from two regions, and each region corresponds with one Kafka topic partition. So we have two subtasks processing this data, um, each subtask processing data pertaining to one region. Uh, and then you'll also notice region two has roughly three times the amount of data as region one. So it's a very skewed data set. When we ran our job on this data without addressing watermark skew, uh, we quickly saw high back pressure in the source operators. This caused message processing to become really slow and we ended up canceling our job after two and a half hours. Then we ran the same backfill, but this time with our source synchronization implementation and um, we noticed that back pressure was much lower, and as a result, message processing was much faster. We were able to complete the exact same backfill in under 37 minutes. So our fourth and final challenge that we ran into uh, was when the data we were processing from the data lake didn't have a corresponding physical Kafka topic. Since our dual source consumer is so tightly coupled um, with our data lake implementation and Kafka, it didn't make sense to create a switchover if the Kafka topic didn't exist. So in these cases, well, we, we would need to create a single consumer to handle all the data lake data and simply run the consumer in data lake only mode. Uh, yeah, so now I wanna move on to some of the use cases and future work. So let's circle back to the use case that we presented at the beginning. Uh, there, we had some teams at Yelp requesting historical uh, results from our bot detection platform. The bot detection platform is powered by a Flink job that processes a rather large Kafka topic of messages coming from web, mobile, and uh, some of our backend services. The Kafka stream that, this, uh, that our bot detection Flink application ingests has terabytes of data per day coming into the stream, and the stream only has a retention of a few days. So before the data falls out of retention, we send it to our data lake for long-term storage. Uh, the problem that we were running into without a Flink data lake source was that our Flink applications couldn't be backfilled, which led to certain limitations. Uh, the first one is that we couldn't replay old data if new features were introduced or if the Flink application changed. And we're also vulnerable to data gaps when there are long outages and the Flink application didn't, doesn't have a chance to read records from the uh, input stream before they fall out of retention. And as I mentioned, there were other teams at Yelp that sought to do analysis on some historical bot detection results. Um, so with our new Flink data lake consumer, we were able to address 
some of these limitations and unblock our users by successfully backfilling terabytes worth of data. Uh, we're also we're also able to use the exact same application logic uh, that was running in the real time pipeline. So in other words, we were able to use the exact same code to perform the backfill, except we swapped our Kafka consumer for our new data lake consumer. And for our next steps, um, we're looking to support bootstrapping state for some of our other Flink applications. So since we've created this dual source um, design, we we can seamlessly switch over from sourcing from the data lake to sourcing from Kafka. Um, and that allows us to support use cases such as building Flink state using the data lake data and then transitioning and using that, that built up Flink state to process real time data from Kafka. Yeah, we're also looking forward to eventually adopting Flink's new hybrid source. So uh, the hybrid source proof of concept was recently merged by uh, the Flink community um, into the upcoming Flink version 114. So the hybrid source will vastly simplify our switchover mechanism that we currently have because uh, it'll provide an interface for specifying two sources where we can switch from source A to source B once source A is finished. Uh, so it will eliminate our current switchover design of manually throwing a data lake finish exception to crash and, crash and reinitialize our job. Uh, yeah, and finally, I want to give some acknowledgments to some of the other related talks that came before us. The first one is from Yelp, where one of our coworkers presented the real-time bot detection platform that we run on Flink. Uh, this is the same application that we highlight in our use cases. So Lyft also gave uh, a pretty enlightening talk a few years ago about the difficulties of bootstrapping state in Apache Flink, uh, which, which is a, a great uh, first talk to start framing our questions around. And finally, Stripe gave a series of talks about how they used the, the Flink operator state and manually throwing exceptions to create the, a switchover mechanism before hybrid source existed, which is, which is a design that we adopted for our dual source. Um, they also gave some talks about watermark skew, which helped, uh, helped with some of our challenges that we, that we talked about. So if you're interested in learning more in depth about any of these topics, uh, I would definitely recommend checking these, these talks out. And I also want to give a thank you to some of the other members at Yelp who worked on this project, um, Gunther, Gingying, and Caitlin. Uh, and we're also hiring. So if you're interested in Flink, Kafka, Cassandra, or any of these similar technologies, uh, consider checking out our hiring link. And if you want to learn more about other projects at Yelp or what it's like to be an engineer at Yelp, you can check out our socials. And yeah, that's the uh, end of our presentation. So thanks for listening. Um, I think we have some time to take some questions in the in the chat. Um, okay, so I see one question. Um, would tiered storage in Kafka solve this issue? Solve this too? I know that this feature was announced long ago, but don't have um, the status. Sophia, do you know? You want to take this one? Yeah, I, we're, I'm not that familiar with tiered storage in Kafka. I don't know uh, to what extent um, they could provide the same level of long term retention that a data lake could provide. Um, so I don't know if that would be as flexible. Um, Kafka is a permanent store. I think Kafka um, is, is probably a more expensive uh, way to permanently store data um, than, than, than um, a, a, a Parquet S3 lake. And then also I think with S, uh, the Parquet format and S3, it's also queryable via other engines. Um, so Yeah, we can wait. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and to add on to Sophia's answer, if, if we had Kafka without any retention policies and we just held on to all the data, then you wouldn't need this uh, because you could simply just read the Kafka stream. But 
it's much cheaper to store our data in data lake. Yeah, I think that's that's a, an involved question uh, about about the costs. Um, I think we probably have to defer that one to, to some more, maybe an asynchronous chat or something. I don't, I don't really have that data. But. Yeah, thanks so much for pointing out the tiered storage. We'll have to take a look at that as well. when it comes up. <laughs> I guess we'll wait for two more minutes for any um, any other questions and then we'll, uh, a couple more minutes and then we'll close the chat. Yeah, uh, thank you to everybody for attending our talk. Um, we, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, I guess we'll kind of adjourn here. Is that what do you think, Charles? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Oh, uh, one last question. Yeah. Uh, um, well, we so um, so there could be some duplication in the data lake, but we don't deal with that. Um, so, th so the question was about: uh, Do we have to deal with duplication of records? We keep a pointer into each file as we read it, and we serialize that out uh, when we write the state. So if we restart from state. Um, since we've counted how many messages or how many rows within each file we've uh, output, we won't duplicate data on the output. Of course, if somehow the application crashes um, while it's before before checkpointing, um, and then we restart from the previous checkpoint, that's kind of a feature of checkpoints in Flink that um, if you periodically checkpoint, then you could output some duplicated data. I don't think we've evaluated Pulsar, but uh, thanks for the suggestion. We can take a closer look at it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think if there's no other questions, I'll just wait a few more. Seconds and then and then we'll adjourn. Oh. oh, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for attending. Yeah, it was it was fun. Okay, all right. Thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, all right. everyone. Well, thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks, Charles. All right.